let's understand the first of the mandatory checks that is the plastic collapse let's first understand what is a plastic collapse a plastic collapse is defined as the one where there is a general failure of a section what you mean by general failure is if we consider a cylinder which is subjected to internal pressure what we don't want is the entire cross section getting ruptured or cracked in total since we are dealing with ductile materials we will not get a glass right brittle fracture but we'll get uh, in this particular mode of failure, we get total yielding across the entire cross section. We don't want this to happen and the first mandatory check which is known as plastic collapse check is to prevent against this mode of failure. There are three different ways of doing plastic collapse check. The first one is elastic stress analysis, the second is limit load analysis and the third is elastic plastic analysis. Here we are discussing only the elastic stress analysis mode which is a bit older and uh, has been in use for more than 50 to 60 years and hence you will find that it is very widely used for various applications. The elastic analysis, as the name suggests, considers the material to be perfectly elastic. That is, if you consider that is the material model consists of a stress strain curve, which is a straight line. That is, material can reach. There is no concept of yield stress here. The material can take any value of stress, and uh, stress is proportional to strain. So the material model in this analysis is perfectly elastic. In a typical finite element analysis, at various points of the component being analyzed, you will get the six components of the stress, that is you will get the values of sigma x, sigma y, sigma z and the three shear components tau xy, tau yz and tau zx, where xyz are your global coordinate system which you are using for your analysis. The important part of this procedure is categorization of this particular component. So each of this component, each of the six component is categorized. How these components are categorized, we will see a little while later. Each of the stress category, you compute the equivalent stress using one Mises criteria. So, we will determine the equivalent stress for each of the category of the stress. And finally, the equivalent stress which is computed in the previous stress is compared to an associated limiting value. So, depending on which category you are choosing, you will have different limiting value. The stress categorization is done based on three criteria. The first one is based on location. The second one is based on the type of stress. And the third one is based on the nature of loading. Let's understand this concept with the help of an example. So consider a case where we are considering a junction of an end cover which is of elliptical shape to that of a cylindrical shell. So we are considering this particular geometry and it is subjected to different types of loading. The first categorization which is based on location if you are considering a location which is away from discontinuity such as a location in the head which is away from the junction, 
this is known as general stress the stresses in this zone are considered as general stress whereas if you are considering a location which is near to the discontinuity they are considered as local stresses so that is the meaning of general and local stress now let's understand based on the type of stress at any cross section such as if you consider this cross section you will find that on this cross section the stress variation can be obtained and let's say it is of certain nature so from point P to point Q, the stresses sigma x is varying in this particular fashion. So, sigma x at point P is having value as given here and it changes to another value in a fashion that is shown here. If you compute across section PQ, what is the average value of stress? So, that is known as the membrane stress. So, if you calculate the average value of stress in this particular section, so this is known as the membrane stress component on section PQ. If you compute the component of this stress which varies linearly from point P to point Q, so for example, if you compute the variation of the stress which varies from in a linear fashion from point P to point Q of the given distribution. So, this particular component is called as bending stress component and the remaining part is called as the peak component. So, you, you have the membrane component, the bending component and the remainder is the peak component. So, that is the second part of the categorization and the third part is based on nature of loading. So, there are loadings which are known as non-limiting or non-self-limiting. such as the internal pressure. So, under this loading, as the internal pressure increases, the stresses continuously keep on increasing and there is no limit as to the loading. So, these are known as the primary stress category, the stresses which are arising because of non-limiting load, non loads are termed as the primary stresses and the stresses which originate from secondary loading. So, examples of secondary loading or this nature of these loadings is a self-limiting and typically they are based on one good example of this stress is uh, thermal stresses. The nature of these stresses is such that these stresses do not increase indefinitely as in the case of primary loading. If you induce a thermal stress at, at any point, for, sex, for example, from point P to point Q, there is some temperature gradient because of which thermal stresses are getting generated. These stresses, as you keep on increasing the delta T between point P and point Q, the stress will keep on increasing, but they will not increase beyond the yield stress. There is a separate discussion for that which we are not going to cover here. So, the loadings which are thermal like the thermal loading or more universally the loadings which are dis dependent on the displacement are treated as the secondary loadings and their nature of such loadings is they are self-limiting. So, to summarize at any cross section once you obtain the stress distribution, using the stress distribution, depending on the location, you can classify that those stresses as general stresses or local stresses. Depending on the distribution of the stresses, 
we can split the stresses into three components that is the membrane stress, the bending stress and the peak stress and the third based on the loading type whether it is self-limiting or non-self-limiting you define them as primary and secondary loading. The stress categories are used to define the allowable limits which are defined by what is known as popularly as ASME Hopper diagram. So this particular diagram gives you for each category of stress. So we have defined the categories based on different criteria. So for each category what is allowable stress is given by this particular diagram. In this particular diagram you will find for a particular combination that is for example if you want to know what is the limit for general primary membrane stress you will first locate the primary stress in this diagram, then you locate the general stress and then membrane stress. It gives you some examples as to where this category exists and then it gives you the limit is S where S is the allowable stress. If you want to know what is the allowable stress for primary local membrane stress, you will again go to primary local membrane and you will get the categories and you will find that allowable stress is defined as 1.5 times S. That is if you are having a general membrane stress, the limit is S and if you are having local membrane stress, the limit is higher, that is 1.5 S. Similarly, for other categories such as secondary loading, peak loading, you can find what are the allowable stress through this diagram. In order to use the Hopper diagram, we can note that we must be able to categorize the stresses out of the different categorization. The general and local can be determined based on the location. So this is by observation. So which location you are dealing with, you can find out what is whether it is general or local. Similarly, based on the type of loading, you can determine whether the stresses are primary or secondary. So this is again by observation. However, to determine the membrane bending and peak stress components, one need to do some kind of mathematical operations on the stresses obtained to get this particular stresses. The process of obtaining the membrane bending and peak stresses from the total stress distribution is known as stress linearization. And the remaining part of this session deals with mainly the stress linearization procedure. As, as we know, in finite element analysis, you get total stress distribution. That is, if you are considering stresses at a junction of head to that of shell, one would obtain the stresses which are changing from inner surface to outer surface. So at every point of the body near to this zone of interest, we will get different values of stresses. And at every point, we will find there will be six stress components that is sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, tau xy, tau yz and tau zx. Now, using this stress distribution which is spread over the entire body, one has to determine the membrane bending and peak stress components. In order to do that, we use a procedure or rather the design code, the ASME design code gives a specific procedure. Let's understand how to use that procedure. Once you have done that procedure, you will get what is known as linearized stresses. So you will get for sigma x, one would obtain what is membrane stress, what is bending stress and what is peak stress. Similarly, for each of the component, you will get the three components. The membrane stress components for 
each of the component that is membrane stress for sigma x for sigma y and so on are combined using the appropriate theory in this case the von Mises theory to obtain the equivalent membrane stress and then the applicable limits as given in the Hopper diagram are used to evaluate whether the membrane stresses are within limit or they are not within the limit. In order to do the linearization, one has to understand the concept of stress classification line. Stress classification line is nothing but a line drawn across the entire cross section of the body. So, for example, if we are considering a head to shell junction as shown here, one can consider a line which is passing through inner to outer point of the body and that straight line is called as stress classification line. Another example is the nozzle to shell junction as shown here. So, the stress classification line could be as shown here or it could be another line which is as shown there. So, as you can see, you can draw practically infinite number of stress classification lines at a particular location, but there are some guidelines as to how to choose these stress classification lines. The guidelines to locate the stress classification lines, there are many more, but the most important criteria is that the stress classification line is expected to be normal to the maximum stress component, the orientation of the maximum stress component. However, practically getting the stress distribution plotted and obtaining the direction of largest stress component at different locations is very time consuming and impractical. As such, uh, accepted norm is to draw stress classification line which is normal to the mid surface. So, you draw the mid surface line and draw a line which is perpendicular to the cross section and that would be an acceptable approximation to the requirement given in the code. So, that is a criteria which is used to locate the stress classification line. Apart from that, there are some more uh, considerations, but we need not go into those details at this stage. Once you have chosen the stress classification line, in order to do the stress linearization, there are three alternatives, alternative approaches are available. Out of this, the structural stress method is the one which is recommended by ASME Section 8 Division 2 and in most post-processing tools provided by commercial finite element software such as ANSYS, they are inbuilt. So, although there are three methods, the structural stress method will be used for the stress linearization. In this particular method, the stresses at any particular cross section, so for example, if you are considering this cross section, the stress distribution is as given by the line which is shown on this particular diagram. For each of the components, so you have to remember that this linearization is to be done for each component separately. For each component that is sigma x, sigma y and uh, so on. So, all six components you have to do the procedure to obtain the membrane bending and the peak stress components. In order to order obtain these components, the underlying equations are given as follows. The membrane stress is obtained by the formula which is given here. Here, sigma ij, it indicates each of the stress components. So, sigma 1 1 is equal to sigma x, sigma 2 2 is sigma y, sigma 3 3 is sigma z, sigma 1 2 is tau x y, sigma 1 3 is tau x z and sigma 2 3 is tau y z. So, this in this case the stresses are given in terms of the tensor notation. So, using the formula which is given, you can calculate 
the membrane stress component for sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. So, for example, if you apply this formula to sigma x, we will find that sigma x membrane at a particular stress classification line is given as 1 by t, where the t is the length of that cross section where the SCL is drawn, integrate from 0 to t sigma x dx. Similarly, the bending stress formula is given and once you obtain the membrane and bending stress, the peak stress component is obtained by simply subtracting the appropriate membrane and bending components from the inner and outer surface of the cross section. At the end of this procedure, one would obtain six membrane stress components, six bending stress components and six peak stress components. The next step is to calculate three principal stresses at the ends of the stress classification line based on the components of membrane stress, membrane plus bending stress components. So, we will find principal stress corresponding to so, you will have sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 for membrane and similarly the three principal stresses for membrane plus bending stress component. We are talking here for membrane plus bending and not individually bending because there is no separate limit for bending. You are, the bending limit is always combined along with the membrane limit. That is why we are getting the combined membrane plus bending stress limit. Once you get the three stresses, using this you can calculate the von Mises equivalent stress at the end of the SCL. So, you will get at the SCL what is the sigma equivalent, the sigma von Mises stress corresponding to membrane and sigma equivalent corresponding to membrane plus bending and similarly sigma equivalent for peak. And once you obtain this, the last step is to compare the calculated stresses against the allowable stresses. So, allowable stresses are given in the Hopper diagram, which was explained previously. So, once you find that the stresses are within the limits given by the Hopper diagram, that particular analysis can be concluded. If the stresses are exceeding the limits, one would have to do some changes in the geometry in order to obtain the, in order to satisfy the criteria of analysis. We have, com we have covered too many concepts in this section and it may be a little confusing. So, let us summarize what we have seen till now. We have seen that for doing design by analysis, there are four primary checks which needs to be done, out of which we are into the first check which is known as plastic collapse check. In the plastic collapse check, we are checking against general failure that is the entire cross section failing. So, we want to prevent this particular a general failure. For doing primary collapse, there are three alternatives out of which we are looked into what is known as elastic stress analysis alternative. In the elastic stress analysis alternative, one of the main idea is that of stress categorization. And the other idea is, as the name suggests, you are using a perfectly elastic material. The stress categorization is done in three ways. The first one is based on the location. So, you could have a general or local stresses. The second one is based on the distribution of the stress. So, that is the membrane stress, bending stress and peak stress at a particular 
location and the last one is based on the type of loading so based on type of loading you can have a primary stresses and you have secondary stresses out of this the location based categorization and loading based categorization is done by observation whereas for calculating the membrane bending and peak stresses you use what is known as stress linearization the stress linearization is used for each of the six stress components so you have the six stress components which are given as sigma y sigma x sigma y sigma z and so on for each of this component one obtains the value of membrane bending and peak stress so for each of these one would obtain three components and then for taking the membrane component from each of these you calculate the three principal stresses so you calculate the principal stresses and from that one calculates the equivalent stress which in division 2 is von Mises stress so at the end of this you will get the equivalent von Mises stress for membrane and for membrane plus bending and another one for membrane plus bending plus peak each of this there is a separate limit which is defined in the hopper diagram so in the hopper diagram one gets the allowable stresses which are for each of the subcategories which are defined you check whether it is safe or not safe at this particular stage so this gives you overall picture of how the plastic collapse check using the elastic stress analysis works